shift master. So we just wanted to welcome you here and let you know what you can expect in the next hour. If this is your first time here, we're so excited to have you engage with us today. It may be a bit awkward navigating a new church experience, so we want to go through a couple things that you could expect this morning at Eagle Moth. A couple things we do every week in our gathering is we take time to worship God through music and also listen to teaching from the Bible that we can apply to our daily lives. We believe that the Bible is where we can turn to, to not just gain wisdom, but to encounter God through the person of Jesus Christ. You may see people raising their hands during the musical portion of our time together today. This is a way that we posture ourselves before God and we worship. If you're new, there's no pressure to behave in any certain way. You can sit, you can stand, you can sing along, or you can be silent and read the words on the screen. We believe that no matter where you are in life, Jesus wants to meet with you. So we just encourage you to be open to what he has for you today. If you have any questions or concerns throughout the morning, you can find one of our pastors, or you can look for our hospitality team wearing these tags and they will be happy to help you or direct you to someone who has the answer to your question. If you have any questions about our church or following Jesus, we would love to help you find some answers. Please visit our website at eaglemont.church where you can find more information about Eaglemont and you can find some contact information for the church office and our pastoral staff. Welcome to Eaglemont. We are so glad that you're here. Good morning, everyone. Why don't you stand with us this morning?
everyone and welcome to Eaglemont Church. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Carissa and I'm one of the worship leaders here. And we are so glad that you've all joined us today, whether you are here in person or you're engaging with us online, welcome. These next few moments, we're gonna take some time to continue just to sing some songs of praise to our awesome God. And this next song is called Same God, and it's a newer song. Um, a few weeks ago, we introduced it. So maybe some of you have heard it already here, or maybe you've missed it and this is gonna be your first time. Maybe you've heard it on the radio and you already know it and are familiar with it. This song just talks about, hence the name, Same God. As he was in the Bible times, he's the same God as he was, as he is today. The same God who um, parted the Red Sea is the same God he is today and can do miracles like he did back then. And after we sing a few more songs of worship at the end, we are going to take a time to pray for some needs here. So I just thought this song really just speaks to how if we're going through something, God is good. God is here. God is with you. And so let that just be our, our prayer and our anthem this morning. So join with us.
said earlier, I'm gonna just take this time to, to pray for the needs that are represented in this room and outside this building. So if you have a need, feel free to lift a hand just as a sign of surrender to God this morning. Lord Jesus, we come to you. We know you hear us, God. We come to you with all the needs in this room and for us who are maybe praying for those that are not here, God, and we, we give it to you, Jesus. We know that we cannot carry this on our own. And maybe some of us have been trying, God, and it is just weighing us down. God, we pray that in these moments, we will just completely give this issue, this this problem, this tough time, this difficult season to you, Jesus. Right now, I pray that every weight would be lifted, God, that we wouldn't carry it anymore on our own. We wouldn't carry it on our own anymore. We would give it to you for you to carry, God. And we know you can do that, Jesus. We just pray, Jesus, for diseases, for medical issues that are going on right now in bodies. We pray for restoration. We pray for healing, Lord God. You are the God of miracles, and we pray for a miracle right now for whatever is going on, Jesus, in people's lives, God, with their health. We pray, Jesus, for restoration in that, God. We pray for relationship issues, family issues, Lord God, things that are so difficult and so tough, Lord Jesus. We just pray for relationships to be mended, for steps to be made, God, to, to move forward in mending those relationships, God, and we give that to you again this morning, Jesus. We pray, Lord God, for financial issues, God. We pray for the needs right now and finances for people, Lord God, who may be struggling, Jesus, who, who may be finding it hard to, to even buy groceries, God. We pray for your miraculous work to move in those situations. May a, a haul of groceries show up at someone's door that they weren't expecting, God. May you... Um, you are so creative in your miracles and we just pray for you to show up in those moments right now for people who are facing financial need, Lord Jesus. We pray for every need in between, Lord God. Every little thing, Jesus, that sometimes we think is even too small, we pray that we would all know it's not and we would give it to you, Lord God. We pray we would never never waver in coming to you, Lord Jesus, that we would speak out the needs, God, and know that you are there and that you are there to carry us through hard times, Jesus, and hard seasons, Lord God. Jesus, I, I lift up the church to you too, God, as, as we have a, a need, as we've yet to face another flood in the basement, Lord God. And Jesus, we know that you are here through it all and, and you see the end, God, and we just trust in you, God, and we give that to you, Jesus. We thank you that you love us so much, God, that no matter what we do, you are always there for us and always loving us, Jesus, no matter what. We thank you for who you are, Lord God. And we give this all to you, every knee here to you. We lift it up and just say, here it is, God. We trust in you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated, but kids, you can stay standing. But as you heard me just pray, in case you didn't know, there was a flood in the basement again. So you guys can meet your leaders at the back. They should be there right away. If they're not, maybe give them a second. And you're going to go upstairs. Everybody head upstairs. There's a blue room. I think I see them waiting for you. So parents, please note that you guys will also head upstairs to get, obviously, preschool and elementary today. Have a great time, kids. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us in person or online. My name is John, and I'm the youth pastor here at Eaglemont Church. So if you're exploring Eaglemont for the first time, Welcome. We'd love to answer any questions that you may have. And for those of you here in person, please fill out the I'm New card that will be right in front of you in the chair pocket in front. And you can drop it off at the kiosk welcome center by the exit doors. Or you can go to eaglemont.info and click on the I'm New button and leave us your contact information. Thank you so much for allowing us to, get to have the opportunity to help you find a place of belonging here at Eaglemont. So Eaglemont family, I... As an individual and us as a pastoral team, just want to thank you for those of you who are consistently giving to our church on a weekly basis. You're giving to the works of God through this local church. And God will honor you as he has promised to take care of all your needs and to trust you as you give to him. Some of you might need to grow more consistently in this, in this means of worship of giving. And something that can help is automatic withdrawals. 
And this is just as much worship as any other form of giving. So if you're interested or have any questions, just contact Maureen, and she'll give you all the details that you need. You can give online or find out how to e-transfer by going to eaglemont.info and click on the Give button. Or use the debit machines at the welcome kiosk beside the gym exit doors. So our kids' ministry is providing a Do You Know the Books of the Bible Family Challenge. So there's a whole song that helps the whole family together learn and remember the books of the Bible this summer. So to find that link to do the song, go to eaglemont.info and click on the Books of the Bible button. Send a video of your whole family, all of you, all together. I know parents, it might be a little bit challenging, but you know it with your kids. It's for the kids. So with that, you can take the video, send it to ministry at eaglemontchurch.ca. Congratulations to Ashley and her kids, Garrett and Tamsin, for being the first family to complete the challenge, and they get to enjoy a landmark movie pass. Give me a round of applause. And so for any other families who are going to submit videos, you still get something. You get a Dairy Queen gift card, even though it's a little bit, it's a little bit more than nothing. So um, <laughs> the deadline for that is August 31st to submit your videos. So to keep up what's happening around Egamont Church, you can sign up for our newsletter that goes out monthly at egamont.info. At that same website, you can also receive and look at the blog that Pastor Marlowe shares every single week. So that might also go to your promotion or junk folder, so make sure you keep an eye out for that. And be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook to keep up with what's going on and subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch any services that you might miss on a weekly basis. So Brennan is coming up to speak for this Sunday. Thanks, Pastor John. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Brennan. I'm the worship pastor here. If you haven't met me and if you're new, uh, welcome. We're so excited that you're with us this Sunday. Um, before we jump in, just a kind of a mini announcement. Uh, pastor Marlo and Miriam are on a two-week vacation. So, you know, um, they're just, of course, trying to disconnect and relax. So um, if you have something to reach out about, if you could just wait until they're back from vacation, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, so, we are in middle of the summer, middle of our parable series. Uh, the parables are teachings of Jesus. Okay, so parables are just short stories which um, taught lessons. Jesus used them to represent or reveal something about, you know, who he was or what he was doing or what the kingdom of God was all about or what it was, you know, supposed to be like to follow Jesus and to be like him. Uh, Jesus used parables for two main reasons. One reason was that he was the greatest teacher that ever lived. So he used these stories. He used uh, just, you know, he was intelligent. He used these little stories that people would relate to and understand and would stick in their minds. Um, and then that would teach them lessons of the kingdom of God, of following Jesus. And, um, of course, Jesus was speaking to crowds of people, and most people couldn't read or write. It's not like they were taking notes. It's not like they could go back and listen on the podcast later if they missed something. They needed to remember what he was teaching. So these stories were a great way to communicate a lesson or to communicate uh, something important to this crowd and make it memorable. So that's the one main reason. The second reason that, that uh, Jesus used parables, and yeah, like you'll, if you read through the Gospels, you'll read a lot of parables. Second reason Jesus used them was to actually mask his message, which sounds weird, surprising, like why is he not just like being clear about what he wants to say? Well, as you may know, the story of Jesus, what he said and did got him killed. So he would actually use parables to kind of cover up his message a little bit. Because if he clearly spoke it, if he clearly came out saying, I am fully God, I'm fully human, I'm the savior of the world, I'm here to save everyone, that would have got him killed way earlier. He wouldn't have been able to travel around for three years and do his ministry and heal people and teach people and show us how to live. Um, so he actually used his parables to kind of cover up his message. And the Bible says, you know, those who had ears to hear, those who were really searching for God and for truth could maybe understand his parables and think about them and find the truth in them. And those who were against Jesus were confused by what he was saying and what he was teaching when he just told these stories. So those are the two main reasons why we have a lot of parables. Um, 
So we are talking about a few parables today that are kind of all on the same uh, theme of feasts. We're looking at Luke chapter 14, 7 to 24. If you want to turn in your Bibles with me, or you'll see it on the screen once I start reading. So uh, just to set the scene, the first six verses of this chapter tell us that Jesus was at the house of a prominent Pharisee for a meal. Again, uh, uh, the Pharisees were the Jewish religious leaders of the time. And Luke tells us that he was being watched closely. So, you know, maybe some Pharisees are, are curious and interested in what Jesus has to say, and we're, we're listening. But uh, as we know, a lot of the Pharisees were hostile to him and to his teaching. And they were trying to trap him in his words and his actions and accuse him of being a false teacher. So they're, they're watching him closely. Um, but anyway, we get to verse 7, which is the start of what we're looking at today. So let me read that for us. So verse 7 says, When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when the host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So uh, in this time, the place of honor at, at a meal would be to the right and to the left of the host. That was seen as, as the place of honor. honor. And now what, what Jesus is telling this group of Pharisees, um, or this group at the Pharisees' house, really just, it, it just sounds like social advice. Like I read it and I'm like, is this a, is this a parable? I, but, and it just seems like, oh, you don't want to be embarrassed? Uh, then don't take the seat of honor. And if you want peop- if you want to look good in front of people, take the lowest seat and then, then they'll move you up. But Jesus didn't come to earth to just give, you know, good social advice and the way he acted. He wasn't worried about like being embarrassed either. So there was obviously more that Jesus meant by this story. And uh, even and Luke, in verse 7, says that Jesus told them this parable. Okay, so we know that it represents something. Okay, so in these parables that we're going to read, uh, the host is, repre- uh, represents God. And the, the meal is, is his kingdom and the feast of the kingdom of God. So uh, the biblical scholar N.T. Wright says that the rest of this chapter makes it clear that this parable is about how the Jewish people of Jesus' day would fight and push themselves forward in the eyes of God. So this, this parable, and we're just kind of, we're going to have three little sections of, of verses to go over, so we're just kind of going to give a quick overview of, of each. Um, this parable is about pushing yourself forward in the eyes of God. These, these, these Pharisees, these Jewish leaders, they wanted to seem so holy, and they wanted to do all the right things, but in doing so, in, in wanting to be honored in the eyes of man and the eyes of God, they, they push others to the side. So there, there's a danger with this, with this sort of, of pride. If you want to be exalted in the eyes of man, and even exalted in the eyes of God, there is danger in doing that. There's damage done when we desire praise and, and achievement um, above desiring to love others. You know, we'll, we'll use people, we'll hurt them, we'll see them as, as less than, we'll abandon them when they're no longer useful to what we need. But that is the opposite of the heart of God. The, the generous host, the generous God that we serve, has room at the table for everyone. And the greatest are those, as Jesus points out, the greatest are those who serve people. So this isn't social advice in that you'll be honored by people if you take the lower seat. This is a parable that if you humble yourself and take the least position and serve people, that God will bless you. That God will see that. And he will honor you. So, you know, of course we want, we want to know that we're doing well in life. We want people to think well of us, or we want God to think well of us. And those are, those are good desires. Those, but if those are our first desires, okay, that's where things get, get messed up. That's where we lose our focus on what we're here on earth to do. Which, as disciples of Jesus... What we're here on earth to do is to love God and love others. That's, that's the command that he gave. To sum up everything that we do, that the Bible says, it's to love God and love others. 
just as Jesus teaches in this parable, people that take on a life of humility and value others above themselves will be lifted up and blessed in the kingdom of God. Not just a a future blessing in heaven, although that is something we definitely look forward to and know uh, will be a beautiful gift in the end, but blessing now. If you serve others and you humble yourself, you'll have a closer relationship with God. And, And living in that goodness and that beauty and that peace of that close relationship with the Father is the greatest blessing that we can have on earth. And uh, again, the Bible just goes through, you know, I just have this verse in Philippians 2 where Paul points out um, humility and how important it is. And it's one of my favorite passages. If you don't know it or if you kind of know it, I encourage you to go to Philippians 2 and memorize it, reread it, and just have it in your heart, in your mind. I'm just going to read some of this. Paul just emphasized it as just so important for the church is to be humble, to have unity. He says, uh, Philippians 2 Verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, Jesus, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And the verse goes on as just this triumphant victory of Jesus, and it's amazing. But uh, we must remember that to follow Jesus is to learn to serve others, to live in humility. Uh, Just remember that verse, church. In in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who who humbled himself when he came down for us, to die for us, to to live on earth and show us how to live. He, he, He humbled himself and was a servant for us, and we are to do the same thing. So that's the call from the first parable. The call to, to face our pride, to, to f- look at the ways that our life revolves around us instead of loving others and serving others. This parable is just a time to see that, that pride is the opposite of the heart of God and the way of Jesus and the way of the kingdom. So there may be something that you know, comes to mind, or maybe this is just a time that later you can just think about and pray about and ask God to reveal, God, where am I prideful? Where am I putting myself first? You know, and, and like anything with the way of Jesus, it's a lifelong process of coming back to, to Jesus. Of course, pride is just so destructive in our relationships, in our way of love, that you know, we need to return to the place of surrender, of confession, and of, of recommitment to the way of Jesus, and then growth. We need to do that over and over and over again through our lives. So this parable is just about that, facing our pride, learning to be humble. So we're going to move on to verses 12 to 14, which say, um, it says, Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So here Jesus is teaching again on the the kingdom of God, like he does so often. How to live in the way of Jesus, okay? It's not just good social advice. Again, it's not even just about about meals in this parable. It's, uh, although I think that is an important thing, but it is about our whole lives. Those who follow Jesus take care of, and invite those in who are less fortunate or marginalized. You know, it's not like Jesus was saying, never spend time with your friends and, and your family and uh, uh, rich neighbors, I guess, if you have any. But uh, as he points out, there must have been this expectation that, okay, I'll put on this meal for my friends and family or this person, and then they'll pay me back, so I'll be repaid. So there's this expectation, either obviously culturally, that that was going on. But Jesus is saying that there's greater blessing for those who take care of uh, for those who take care of the poor. And also, not just take care of, but, you know, befriend those who are marginalized. He, he mentions the, the, the crippled, the lame, the blind, because of, in Jesus' day, those are the people that were the marginalized and seen as less than. So who is it today? The poor that Jesus has called us to serve and to love and to invite in. God wants to see uh, the less fortunate lifted up, uh, brought out of a place of pr- a poverty and a life of pain, and that is what we need to be doing as a church, not just not just uh, the church as in 
the pastors, not just, you know, what we do with, with the money that we have, but also as a church, each of us individually, our call is to love people. Our call is to look after those who are less fortunate, who are struggling, who are in pain, and to show them the love of Jesus. And, and this parable and teaching of Jesus touches on another very important practice of Jesus, which is hospitality. And there is such power and, and beauty in this practice, um, just as there was in Jesus' day. You know, bringing people to a table back then was an, was an act of peace. Uh, it was a way of saying that we are equal, and it, it was a way to love people, and it still is a way to love people. Hospitality is just a key component in the way of Jesus that, uh, that church has practiced for thousands of years. And to be honest, I think we are so badly lacking in it in our Western culture and our, and our churches. You know, this is the area of the church that I believe has the capability to just clearly show the love of Jesus to people, to clearly show that the church is a different community than you'll find anywhere else. Hospitality for people, you know, in your church family, the people you know and don't know, for people outside the church, just everyone, we should be inviting people in. And, um, you know, this is also just something that we fall short on because our culture is just individualistic. But also, just note, I just think um, this is something that we fall short on in Eaglemont. And that's just not, not to say that out of um, condemnation, but it's something that us as pastors have, have seen is it's just a, something we can grow in as a church, for sure. Just a weak point of how we follow Jesus together. And we want to see that um, change in this church. You know, even without a home, Jesus practiced hospitality. You can just look at how often most of his ministry was eating meals with people. And, uh, you know, look at how often he was in someone's house eating a meal with someone, making them feel loved and cared for. Even outside the church, I was just doing a little research, like sharing a meal together um, is just a, a powerful thing. It builds unity and community, and it also has shown to raise people's happiness, which is crazy. But this is something that, that God has given us to use in his church for our community to love people. We would love to see this church grow in hospitality. And so if you're starting at zero, start with people you have a relationship with. Start with someone that you've talked to a ton at church, but maybe just never spent time with outside of that. Start with people in a small group you've been a part of. Um, you know, or... Sorry. Uh, yeah. Also, sorry. Please don't um, don't just stick to people like yourself. Older people invite in younger people. Uh, invite in young adults. Older couples invite in and maybe can mentor younger couples. People, you know, you can show them areas of life that you've already walked through, and you can lead them through that. Families invite in older people. Invite in single people. Singleness can feel extremely uh, lonely, and a loving community can make a world of a difference. And older people can speak into a season of life, um, and that can also just make a huge difference. We need an intergenerational, deep community, and the practice of hospitality, of sharing a meal together, is just so powerful. And of course, you don't have to be a good cook. You don't have to um, do anything special. You could do a potluck. You could order in food. Um, you can go out for food, although I think People, having people into your home is something special, but that's just an encouragement on a practice of Jesus that he clearly practiced that we can grow in and that I hope I grow in. And um, we just want to see our church be a loving community, and this is an amazing way to do that through this practice. Okay, so now moving on. After Jesus tells those parables and has those teachings, we have this verse. When one of those at the table uh, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. So th this is an important verse. This is what makes Jesus say the next parable. Okay, the man um, at the table would have been an Israelite, as Jewish people, especially Pharisees, did not intermingle with non-Jewish people, uh, especially at a table. Having a meal together meant that you're proclaiming that you are equal with someone and that there's peace between you. And Jewish people saw themselves as God's chosen people, which they were, but that um, 
led to a perceived you know, superiority and uh, hate in some instances. So they did not associate or eat with non-Jewish people, as they were called Gentile people. Now, there's more, of course, to that background through the Old Testament, and, uh, but I'm just going to skip over that for now. Um, so Jesus, uh, Jesus came to change that, though. The Jewish people would not open up um, to non-Jewish people, and Jesus came to invite everyone in. And I think most of us, maybe you come from a Jewish family, but most of us are very grateful that he did, that he opened up the kingdom of God to everyone. Now, we have this Jewish man at the table saying, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. So he's pronouncing blessing on the Jewish people, the people he thinks will enjoy the kingdom of God, will inherit the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is a um, very important theme in the Bible, in the New Testament, and in the Gospels. So first off, so we're just going to kind of cover that theme so we can get a full understanding of what the Bible means when, you know, when people say kingdom of God. First off, remember that Israel is under Roman rule right now at this time in the Gospels. So for 750 years at this point, Israel as a nation has only been independent for 100 years. But they were back under control from another nation, which happened about 100 years before this. So first, the Assyrians defeated Israel, then the Babylonians took over, then the Persians took over, then Alexander the Great comes in, takes over for the Greeks, and then in 164 BC, you have a short gap of um, independence when Judas Maccabeus led the Maccabean revolt, cleared God's temple of all other idols, and gave Israel their independence. This is what um, Hanukkah celebrates, actually. So that freedom lasted about 100 years. So until the Roman Empire took over. That is where we are now in the story of the Bible. Which gives a little bit more context of like the hate that the Jewish people had for the Roman Empire and the Roman people. You know, um, the Romans were not just the most recent of a long line of captors. They were the people that in the last 100 years took over Israel and took away their freedom. Which, you know, when you read the Gospels and read about like the stories of the Romans are... There's a story about uh, the faith of the centurion, the soldier, the Roman soldier that Jesus says, I have not found greater faith in all of Israel. That, that, is, that brings so much more power to that. That would have been scandalous in the time of the Gospels. Israel would have just seen the Romans as, as the enemy, as the people, like furthest thing from God. Okay, but that is the state of, of Israel now. So in this verse, when this man says kingdom of God, he is thinking that the kingdom of God will happen when Someone in Israel rises up in a, mil, in, a, you know, in a military coup, frees Israel from the Romans, has some great um, you know, victory, and restores Israel as their own nation once again with their own king uh, under God. And you know, he'll be the greatest king Israel's ever had, greater than David, who is revered as the greatest king. But you know, this, this king, this promised Messiah, was the promise that they were looking forward to, to bring the kingdom of, of God. This is what all the Jewish people at the time would have thought the kingdom of God was. We say kingdom of God, and that just means like church and following Jesus, but let's think about what they were thinking. They were thinking a real nation, you know, Israel's land, once again under Israel control, under the uh, reign of an Israelite king. And, you know, if you know the story of Jesus, you know that he was the Messiah, but he was not the Messiah that people expected. He was not the king that people expected, and he didn't bring a physical kingdom he didn't give Israel their, their um, freedom back, but he brought a spiritual kingdom. One that anyone can enter by choosing to follow Jesus. So the man at the table says, you know, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And then Jesus tells this parable. He said, Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great feast and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent a servant to those who had been invited. Come for everything is now ready. So again, uh, the host is, represents God and his kingdom and him inviting his people. So um, in the parable, this would have been someone wealthy, you know, uh, someone that had the means to give a great feast. Most people couldn't do that. So probably someone of status could have been um, for a celebration or something, you know, and it would have been a great honor, though, to be invited and to attend. And also, who doesn't like free food? Like, come on, especially in, in, in this time, Israel would have only had meat 
like a few times a year. So imagine you only get meat. It's a very special occasion. Sorry, vegans, vegetarians, you won't relate. But imagine you get meat a few times a year, and then you get to have this great feast for free. Some just like amazing, amazing top quality roast. It'd be, it'd, be a, it'd be a privilege. It'd be a great day to go. And now, so the custom for these banquets was to have two invitations, just, I guess, the same as, like, a wedding. You have an RSVP that goes out. Are you coming? And then once the RSVPs were in, then the meal could be decided on. If it was a small group, it would be, you know, like a, a duck or a goose or something. Or a bigger, you'd have to prepare more meat, a lamb or, or a fattened calf or something. So the RSVP was important because they didn't want uh, leftover food. Quick history lesson. No electricity back then. I know. Um, so no freezers, no fridges. You know, once meat was prepared, it was going to go bad unless it was eaten. Um, so they would get the RSVPs, then start preparing the food on the day of the banquet. Once the food was ready, the second invitation would go out. And that invitation is just saying, you know, come to the banquet, food's ready, time to start. Okay, but Jesus continues his story. He says, so then on the day of the banquet, he says, but they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Now, I know the introverts in the room might want to defend the people canceling plans last minute, but don't do that. They're in the wrong here. I'm just, of course, it's fine to be an introvert, uh, just teasing. I just don't understand how people don't have FOMO, like if you're missing out all the time. I, this is embarrassing. I have FOMO like going to the bathroom when my friends are over. I like hear a joke and I'm like, oh, I'm missing it, like trying to rush. Um, so anyway, introversion and extroversion aside, Jesus is clearly portraying these excuses as very weak, okay? Like in fact, just um, a scholar said that, that people would have just seen these as just straight up lies, so these are weak excuses. They're in the wrong here. You know, what the people in Jesus' parable did would have been seen as a big disgrace in their culture. Like, huge. Especially, as we talked about, with expensive food, you know, going to waste. To cancel the day of um, would have been just seen as extremely rude, inconsiderate thing to do. And it would have been very disrespectful to the host. Especially in an honor-shame culture, you know, where, um, like many cultures were through history and still are today, to Dishonor someone would be a great offense uh, in the eyes of the Israelites and um, something that would bring you know, shame on you and even your household. So let's walk through the excuses that, that people give. First off, uh, Jesus mentioned three people's excuses, but he says that they all alike began to make excuses. So in this parable, all who were invited didn't show up. All who were invited bailed on the day of the banquet. So verse 18 again it says, the first said, I've just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Again, like I said, um, people just would have seen these as lies. One theologian writes that everyone listening would have seen this excuse as a straight-up lie. I just bought a field, and I must go see it is like saying that you bought a house over the phone, never seen a picture of it, or the neighborhood, don't know where it is, and after you bought it, you are now going to look at it for the first time. Like, it just, it's just a lie. It doesn't happen. Buying land was a very big purchase, reserved for, for the very wealthy, and it was, a, it was a big deal. You would go and see every inch of that land before you purchased it. Same thing with the next excuse, along the same veins. You know, I've just bought uh, five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Five yoke of oxen, meaning ten oxen, uh, another thing that you do not purchase without trying them out. These were very important work animals. You would go see how they work. Are they strong? Do they listen to you as a farmer? Um, not something you, you purchase before testing. Again, it, another very wealthy purchase. Most people were laborers who'd make an average of one denarius a day. An ox cost 100. Um, so this man is saying he spent 1,000 denarii, three times the amount of the average salary, without testing what he was buying. It'd be like saying, I just bought a $200,000 car from someone, and I have to go see what kind of car I got and whether it works. It's just a lie. That's what people would have thought of. So not only is it disgraceful to cancel last minute, but to, but to lie, to just get out of going, would be so incredibly dishonoring and hurtful to the host. Like imagine if this is you and your friends and, or you know, people you cared about just bailing last minute and clearly lying about why. And in this story, God is the host. 
And he was obviously hurt by these excuses, by the people that would not come that were invited. And then the last excuse, I just got married, so I can't come. Um, Deuteronomy 24.5 says, If a man has recently married, he must not be sent to war or have any other duty laid on him. For one year, he's to be free to stay at home and bring happiness to the wife he has married. So most uh, theologians think that this person that made this excuse in the parable would have been, you know, using this Old Testament Deuteronomy verse as an excuse, you know, thinking that he can get out of whatever because he just got married. Uh, even That's a very cool law that God gave to the Israelite people that they can have a year at home for new marriage. Um, so yeah, if he just got married, he could technically be free of, of any responsibilities, but going to a banquet, again, was, was a gift, a great privilege, not, not a burden. And he would have known that he was getting married. He shouldn't have said he would come in the first place. And it would have been much better for him to bring his new wife to this banquet than to use his marriage as an excuse. And also, as you might notice, this man didn't ask to be excused, which again would have been a great shame in, in the Middle Eastern culture and, and even today in any culture would be seen as just rude. No apology, just I can't come anymore. So what Jesus is saying from these excuses is that these people just, they didn't want to come to the feast. They made excuses, but they were, just, they were just lies or they were just trying to get out of going. They said yes, and then they changed their mind and made excuses not to go. So we read on. The servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. Okay, so this parable is really about who will be in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus, in this, in this moment, is, is speaking condemnation over the leaders and the elites of the, of the Israelite people. You know, the people that thought that they were so holy but, but really have rejected the call of God. And, and instead of them, in the kingdom of God will be not just the Israelites, but all who accept the invitation. And the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, those of low standard in the Israelite eyes. And then there's still room. So the foreigner and those outside of Israel are invited in to the kingdom of God, to the feast. They heard the call to come to the banquet, and they accepted. He said, come enjoy the kingdom, and, and they accepted the call. But those who were invited made excuses, which Jesus is putting condemnation on the Israelite people that were going to reject him, that were going to reject his message and put him on the cross. So you had, uh, you know, the people, the Pharisees at the table with Jesus thinking that they will be honored and feast in the kingdom of God, that they are, you know, the most holy and the best in the kingdom of God. And then Jesus says, well, the feast of the kingdom of God will look different than you think. Telling them that, that the people of God will reject his message like they did when they had Jesus crucified. But the people who are marginalized, the people that, that knew they were broken, and, and the non-Jewish people will be welcomed in. This is what Jesus was trying to teach the Israelite leaders. That what they thought would get them into the kingdom of God, their honor, their riches, their status, their perceived holiness their place in God's people would be what gets them into the kingdom. But that's the very thing that excludes them from the kingdom of God because when the invitation came, they just all made excuses. They all had other things to worry about. They made excuses. So now for, now for us today, we have to ask, what are our excuses? What are your excuses? What, what is bringing you away from the kingdom of God? From following Jesus or going deeper in your relationship with him? What kind of things do we explain away as just, as just too difficult, too unrealistic? You know, what, what, what makes, we make these excuses and what we don't realize is that we are missing out on greater blessing. The greatest life that there can be. And this is one that is fully lived for Jesus. So Jesus is calling us today and saying, no more excuses. Come to the feast of the kingdom of God. Come, enjoy my presence, live with me, accept me. 
there's application for all of us. You know, maybe you're, maybe for you, it's making that decision to follow Jesus. And maybe you already follow Jesus, but we make excuses to not go deeper. To not fully accept his call on our lives. To not really enjoy the feast, but instead we're standing up against the wall. You know, by not accepting to follow Jesus or to follow him fully, we are saying that Jesus' offer really isn't good enough. You know, it's not, not quite appealing enough. I'd rather do this with my life or this with my money or this with my time. But there's truly nothing better than to follow Jesus fully. And, you know, we, we don't see that from, from the outside looking in. Tr- truly, we are easily blinded. We're, we're blinded and we're, and we're tricked by what the world has to say is the most important thing and the thing that will make you happy and the thing that will fulfill your life. And we're blinded by, you know, what, what we want and what we naturally want as, as sinful people. And we've done sermons on this, but this might sound weird. We're also blinded and tempted by the things that the devil speaks to us about what will make us happy. Every time you choose to follow Jesus, it will be the best decision that you ever make. You know, we don't see how amazing, how beautiful, how incomparable to anything else that the life Jesus has to offer is. Instead of of, um, choosing greed and hate and pride, when we choose love and humility, it is the best decision that we can make. When you choose to follow Jesus, it is the best decision that you can make. So we need Jesus. And he's made it possible to be with God, to walk with him, to know him, and to become like him. And Jesus is inviting us in now. And he's just saying, no more excuses. Come to the feast. Come to the kingdom of God. Come enjoy the life that I have to offer. The life that I've given you because I laid down my own. A life lived to the full. Through the way of Jesus. The way that we are made to live. We're just going to pray today to close up. And if that is, if you want to make that decision to follow Jesus, I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray for you. You can make that decision now in your heart to completely change your life. And also for those of us who are Christians, there are things, again, that we make excuses to not go deeper. We're going to be praying that God will reveal those things, that God will be speaking to us that God will help us walk through those areas that we have not given him yet. So just if you just want to close your eyes, bow your head with me. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you have given us this life. God, we just thank you for this opportunity to come to you. Jesus, we know that we are we are broken and we're sinful. God, we thank you that you have died for us to make us whole. Jesus, we just accept you as our Lord and our Savior. And we just commit to following you every day of our life. We commit to trust you, to love you more, and to be used by you. God, in these moments, draw us closer to you. Show us the things, God, that we make excuses that we are blinded by. Help us, God, to just fully walk with you in this life. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you that we get to follow you each and every day. Thank you for this church. Amen. Um. Yeah, so once again, if you have chosen to accept Jesus into your heart today, congratulations. That is the most amazing thing that you can do. There will be a QR code up on the screen. Um, If you are even just curious about it or want to know what the next steps are, just as much me, Pastor Brennan, and the other pastors that will be in here throughout the week uh, will definitely be willing and open to have a conversation with you to answer all the questions that you may have. So with that, um, the west side here... Uh, of, of the chairs need to get taken up and put away um, just due to 180 drop-in that's happening every single Thursday and Friday from 4 to 6 p.m. So it'd be really great if 
five of you guys can grab the dollies just inside that door and everyone else can just stack up. It's not too big of an amount of chairs to just put away. So thank you so much for everyone being willing to help out with that. Um, parents, remember, you still have kids. That's an important thing. So with that, you guys have to go up the kitchen side, up the stairs. Uh, the kids, the elementary kids will be in the blue room. So it, it sounds self-explanatory, a blue room. Um, and uh, yeah, with that, you guys can come back downstairs on either side. None of them are blocked off, just the basement. Make sure you don't go down there because, you know, it's not exactly open yet. Um, yeah, and besides that, just make sure if you see anyone new, anyone interesting, maybe someone you already know, make sure to say hi, be welcoming, and yeah, have a great rest of your Sunday. <laughs>